Um, okay, so we'll start with that note. So basically, last week we spoke about the downfall of of, uh, of uh, Shaul and how his essential downfall was the lack of faith in himself, the lack of confidence in himself, and the lack of faith and confidence in his relationship with God and in a sense in God himself, because he was very easily swayed by the people and by the military standing and not necessarily by his own feeling of where we are as a nation and our relationship to God. So he, we left off, he loses the Machut. Shmuel tells him in two instances over uh, two wars that you didn't listen to what God commanded, you didn't follow through, God is not, does, wants a king that's gonna be with him and you're not that king, so he's gonna pick someone else. And that, and this, what we're gonna talk about now is essentially him picking David. Um, God picking David through Shmuel as his, uh, as his Navi to do that. So it's actually very interesting. What we're gonna do for, um, let me just break down what's gonna happen to, in the class, is we're gonna do um, basically two sections where we're gonna talk about, hold on, I'll do a screen share one second. Um, where is my, yeah. So we're going to talk about, one second, let me open up the, we're going to talk about David's rise to power in the sense of, um, and the reaction of Shmuel to God choosing David. And then we're going to talk about, um, there's this parallel we're going to see from, it's a, it's a turn, well, I'll talk in a second, but we're going to see this as David rises, Shaul falls even more. Because right now, where we're at is only Shaul knows this, only Shaul knows that, that he, uh, Shaul and Shmuel know that he lost the Malchut. The nation doesn't know it. They're still treating him and he, uh, like a king. He still is acting like a king. It's not like he's kicked out. He's still, for all intents and purposes, the king. Um, but we're going to see how slowly, slowly that power shifts and Shaul um, falls more and David rises more. And we're going to talk about that in the terms of this Ruach Ra'a and Ruach Hashem that we're going to see being referenced a lot, which we'll talk about. And then we're going to see um, the war with Goliath and the turning point um, in, da in David's identity as a warrior. And through all that, we're going to talk about David entering the king's court. I spoke about this a little bit in, in previous classes about the king's court being this inner circle, the family, the advisors, and how that was. Uh, um, it was a whole. Uh, it was a whole. Um, um, life, you know, life in itself, almost. You know, world in itself. And um, David slowly is able to enter that through um, different steps, which we'll see he takes as a musician, as a Nosei Kelim, and as a warrior. Um, and we're gonna see how he, I don't wanna say infiltrates, but how he sort of walks into that um, path. And then we're gonna, be, um, we're gonna end with, which is gonna be a transition to next time, is um, David's relationship with Shaul's children, specifically Yonatan and Micha, which will, begin to talk about now, which is, which is going to be more um, next week. So um, let's dive in. So what I want to start with is I'm going to make this bigger because it's a little hard to see. So give me a second um, here. Um, so um, what, I, what I'm going to do here in, 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 um, in a big, in the, um, in the first section of the class essentially, is we're going to look a lot of comparisons between things that happened to David and Shaul. And through that, we're going to see the mirroring and the um, essentially the void that David fills um, that, that's lacking in Shaul. So, um, okay, so Vayemer Hashem El Shmuel, and Matai Atamit Abel El Shaul, Vani Mastim and Loch Al Yisrael Malek Harnecha Hashemen. Hold on. Melech Shlach El Yishai Bet Halachni, Kiraiti Bevanav Li Melech. So, what happens here is he loses, um, Shmuel tells the, uh, Shaul, you're not going to be king anymore, and they part, and Shmuel goes home, and essentially, he, um, they don't see each other again, basically, and Shmuel is really um, taking this hard, and there's different explanations of why he's taking this so hard, but it seems that we're going to see through, um, through different, um, different um, events with him and David versus him and Shaul, is that Shmuel was really invested in 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 um in Shmuel in Shaul Machut because even though at the beginning he wasn't so thrilled about it and he was like why do you need a king now and all that he he did want Shaul to succeed he did want him on his side he did have an intimate connection with him and now essentially when he's told that Shmuel is not going to continue 
um, the, sorry, the Shaul is not going to continue, excuse me, as king. He takes it very hard. And God tells him why, I uh, use the word mitabel, mourning, like, you know, when you mourn, God forbid, for, for death, right? He's saying, why are you mourning? Like a very intense sadness he's taking this um, Shmuel. When are you going to stop mourning for Shaul? I, God speaking here, I am disgusted with him. I don't want him to be the king. So therefore, you need to move on. This, you know, you're my messenger as the Navi. You need to, you know, fill your, uh, fill your horn with oil, meaning it's uh, anointing oil, and go pick the new king. <coughs> Excuse me. So God is essentially telling Shmuel, snap out of it. We're past this. This is what it is. And he tells him, go to the house of Yishai Bet Halachmi, Yishai from Bet Lechem, and one of his sons is going to be the king. Okay. Very important note, which we'll talk about in, another, in, a, in a minute, is, um, is he does not specify which son. He tells him one of his sons. And we see he has a lot of sons. He has seven um, or eight sons, depending on where you read from. So, um, sorry, that was, yeah. And he tells him, wait, why is it skipping? Okay. Um, he says, but then Shmuel's response is a very interesting response. He says, how could you command me to do that? How can I do that? How can I go? And Ushma Shaul, Shaul's going to hear this. Shaul's going to hear that I'm going to anoint another person and he's going to kill me. This is a blatant act of rebellion, right? If you're going to um, anoint a king in the lifetime of another king, that's rebellion. So Shaul, so Shmuel is saying, if I go do that, Shaul is going to kill me. And in a sense, rightfully so, right? Uh, he's, he's still the, the sitting king. We can't do that. Um, just interesting, not to be political, but what's going on in America with presidents and everything like that. It's just interesting that, I mean, just made me think of it now. Anyway, um, not to say any more on that. But anyway, um, so Hashem, is gives, God gives him a very interesting response. He doesn't tell him what you would think in a way, saying, I'm God, I'm commanding you this. I'm going to obviously protect you. You know, like he, does, he, he doesn't like tell him what kind of response is that. He, he actually validates the response. Um, and he says, okay, you're right. If, if, Shmuel, if uh, Shaul hears this, then he will kill you. So take a cow, a glak bakad, and go say that you're going to do a, um, a sacrifice. Because that's very normal that the Navi would go and, and um, do sacrifices with different important people. Yishai, we see, was someone that was important. So it's not such an odd thing if he does that. And the, the commentators talk about what, what this response means and also why Shmuel was so hard to go, to, to, to want to go, uh, to go choose another king. And um, Shmuel really, um, like I said before, he was invested in Shaul and he didn't want, in a sense, to put the nail in the coffin and really, like he could tell him you're not gonna continue, but anointing someone else is really saying there's no hope, there's no turning back for you. So that was a hard thing for Shmuel to, to really do after, after all this um, uh, relationship he has with Shaul. So, um, and God, um, uh, and also, it could also be he was, he was, it was a valid fear. And we can't, you know, it says, Lola smocha on this. You can't rely on a miracle that God's going to save you. So you have to do things in a logical way. So God's saying, go and go play this out in a logical way and do a korban. So he he does this. He goes to Beit Lechem and Bekarat Elishai Bazavach Banuchi Odiacha et Asher Taser Mashacha Li et Asher Omer Elecha. God says, go um, organize the sacrifice with Yishai and I will tell you what else to do. So again, this ambiguity in what exactly is going to happen, who's exactly going to be the king, that's something that we saw in the choosing of Shaul as well. So we're going to, we're going to skip on the, on the gray side, if anyone's looking at the screen, where it says Shaul, we're going to look at what happened when Shaul was chosen, and we're going to see the connections here. So when Shaul was chosen, the day before, Vashem Galat Ozen Shmuel Yom Achalifne, the day before Shaul and Shmuel met, he told, uh, Shmuel told, uh, God told Shmuel, machad, tomorrow, I will send you someone from the Shevet of Benyamin, omash, and al Ami Israel, and he will be the leader, you will, you will anoint him the leader of, of my people. Okay? And then Shmuel, um, the next day, Shmuel is going to do a kor, uh, korban. He's going through the korban with the people in his city. And he said, Shmuel ra'ah Shaul, Vashem aneu hineh ha'ish asher amati alecha ze yatsor b'ami. He sees, she tells Shmuel when Shaul walks in, that's going to be the one that's going to lead my nation. 
and Shaul got, uh, comes up to Shmuel and, and he's looking, if you, if you remember the story, I'm not gonna go into it, we spoke about it in, in, the, in Shaul, in the Bat Shaul and a few places ago, but he's looking for Shmuel and then Sh uh, Shmuel invites him to come do the Korban with him and then he tells him he's gonna be the king and that whole story happens. So basically we see here in both stories, um, um, so far we're gonna see some similarities, some differences, but one main similarity, which I think is a lesson that God is trying to impart onto Shemuel and onto us as the readers and the nation as well, is only God has the insider information. Only God fully knows who's going to be king because it's really essentially a king for God. And even though Shemuel is a Navi, he's not going to ever, um, he's not going to know as much as God is going to know, obviously. And the, it's a sign for the Malchut that the, the king always has to be a direct connection with God. And we see also something interesting here that Shmuel um, is told to go seek out David where, um, where Shaul um, seeks out Sh uh, Shmuel. So that's also an interesting uh, nuance in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the choosing of the king, in the, uh, not the, the, the anointing of the kings. Now we see, we continue what happens. And this is very, very, um, also this whole, I find that this whole, that God, um, obviously I'm not God, but I, I feel like, and, and commentators also uh, also say, I'm not making this up out of my head, but there's a lot of um, evidence in the language and in the, um, um, the whole uh, tone that the whole choosing of David is in a sense a, a, a tikkun, a fixing or a, or a correction of the fix of the choosing of Shaul, and this is in part of the fact that the nation was demanding a king as opposed to now maybe they're more ready, and also for Shmuel to see um, uh, what the leader is really about and what what an ideal leader is about. So now he goes. So so let's picture the scene here. I, I skipped a little. I'm not bringing the old psukim, but Shmuel goes to Beit Lechem and the people see him and he's an important figure and they're like, what are you doing here? Like, what's, what do we owe this honor? You know, they were like getting nervous. And he says, no, no, I came to do a, uh, to do a, a sack, uh, you know, a, a zevach with the family of Yishai and it's all good, everything's fine. You know, maybe they thought he was coming to reprimand them or something, but it's all peaceful and great and happy. Then he goes to Yishai's house and he says, let me see your children, your sons. And he said, he brings it, the firstborn Eliab comes in and the first thing Shmuel is, uh, thinks is, ah, neged Hashem this is the guy I'm going to anoint for God. This is his first thought when he sees him. We're going to see why in a second. But you met Hashem al Shmuel, and Hashem, you know, uh, says to Shmuel in Nebuah, like, al tavet el don't look at, don't look at his appearance, the el gova komato, and his height, kima astihu, I am, I am disgusted by him. And he uses the same word he used with Shaul about ma'asti mimelech, right? He used that same word, like disgusted. I don't want that. Ki lo asher yir'eh ha'adam, ki ha'adam yir'eh le'enayim ve'adonai yir'eh le'levav. He says, don't look at the outer appearance. God, the humans see the outward, but God sees the heart. God sees the essence. And this, in a sense, is mirroring when we saw Shaul that he was bachur v'tov, um, right? He's tall, he's good looking. He's taller than all the nation. He stands above the nation. So it seems that Eliab had a similar physical appearance. He was tall, he was good looking, he commanded himself. And God says, don't get swayed by that. That's not what's important. What's important is, um, is the heart, is his essence. And I, um, he brings all, I skipped this, all the parts. He brings all the other children. God says, no, 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 no. And now there's no more children in the house. And it's almost like a Cinderella story, so to speak. Like they're, you know, looking for the glass slipper, who's going to fit. And there's no more people. There's no more sons. And Shmuel knows that there has to be another son somewhere because God told him it's going to be one of his sons. So Shmuel says, Hatamu hanarim, this is all your sons. And then pay attention to how, how he um, one more, the little one, right? In, in direct contrast to Gova uh, Komatom, all that, right? He's little. And this could this could uh, mean that he's the youngest, or it could mean, which he is, but it could also mean that he's physically small, which we'll see. So, and he is a shepherd. He says, go get him from the field. He's obviously with his, with his, with his flock. He's not part of the, 
with the, where the family's sitting now. And he says, bring him because I'm not going to leave until I see him. They bring him. And again, he's, he describes as a good looking. He's, he's um, red, redheaded with, with nice eyes and good looking. So it's not like he's not good looking, but he's, it doesn't seem like he's the same um, command and stature as Shaul and his older brother Eliab was. So now um, this whole um, this whole description, and it's more psukim, I didn't even bring it all, but it's very lengthy. And it's really, in a sense, I think, a, a contrasting and showing us, to blatantly show us what it means to, um, to uh, pick, a, pick a leader and what a leader really is all about. So let's look also now, this is also going to be a key point here, is when Shmuel does the anointing, how he leaves is how he feels almost about the person. So with David, he takes the Kach Shmuel Ken HaShemen, Vayim Shach Otoba Kedev Echav, and he, and he, um, he anoints him amongst his brothers, I meaning only his brothers knew, only his family knew. Oh, sorry. And we're going to talk about this in a minute in more depth. I'm just going to say it now. We'll talk about it in a second. This Ruach Hashem comes to David from that day on. And Shmuel gets up and leaves. That's it. He anoints him and he leaves. And what happened when Shmuel, when Shaul was anointed? He takes the shemen. He puts the shemen, the oil on him. He kisses him. And he says, You are the king that God chose. He gives him these, these encouraging words. He gives him a kiss. And we, I also didn't bring it, but he also gives him the signs, if you remember, the signs that will come true to prove he will be a king. So we see from the get-go that uh, Shmuel is doing this because he has to, he's doing this reluctantly almost, because we see that he didn't want to go in the first place. He goes, this whole process doesn't seem like it's something he wants to do. He does the job that God tells him to do because he's listening to God, but that as the, he's doing the bare minimum, basically. Like, you know, it's like when, when the, the, you know, and when you get an assignment in, in, from work or in school and like you literally do the bare minimum of answering the exact question, no elaboration, like just getting the job done so you need to do it. And this is, I feel like what's happening, just getting it done so that he could say he did it. And so we're gonna flip now back. There was, I feel like this is sort of, a, this is, um, now we're gonna see from now on in the book, there's gonna, it, it's a turning point here. It's gonna be sort of like a constant um, split screen or not split screen, like, you know, back and forth in a movie, how it goes from one, one, one uh, setting to, the, to another setting back and forth, but they're parallel, these things are happening together. So we're gonna see that really throughout the rest of the book, well, till, actually not the rest of the book, till Shaul dies, which is a lot of the book, but till Shaul dies, we're gonna be seeing this back and forth split screen, um, you know, I don't know what the, what the proper uh, movie term for it is, it's not really split screen, but it's back and forth of, um, of what, um, what's happening in David's life and what's happening in Shaul's life. And this is where it all begins. So while this is happening, but it's Lach Ruach Hashem El David Mayomahu Mala, the Ruach Hashem comes to David, and at that same time, or even some of Hashim say a little bit before, Ruach Hashem Sara Me'im Shaul. Like some say the Ruach Hashem had to leave Shaul before it went to David. And Ruach Ra'ame, this, he, got, he got instead this Ruach Ra'ame at Hashem. So what is this Ruach Hashem and Ruach Ra'a? So we see the Ruach Hashem is, is a common phrase we see throughout the Chumash and the Navi um, about leaders that were instilled with this strength from God, this spiritual strength from God. Um, this connection to God, this following this divine path and this divine um, calling almost, right? And this Ruach Ra'a, essentially, I read, um, it's not anything active. I read, I, I was reading about it, about, um, I think it was Rav Abnon Bazak I was reading, but he was explaining how this Ruach Ra'a is not something active. Like a lot of, a lot of, um, um, of Mephashim, and they talk about this, like it's a paranoia, it's an anxiety, it's a depression. But it's almost, he described it, which I, I really, I connected to a little bit, is like, he was saying how like, it's, it's, not, it's not something active. It's a, it's a response to something that's lacking. Like, it's like, if God forbid you lose someone you love, that feeling is not necessarily um, an active feeling of something bad is happening to me right now, right? It's not like I got into a car accident or God forbid someone's sick. It's the lack of what I had that was good with that person that I loved or, what I, or, or you know, an event or something like that, if you're feeling nostalgic. So I, the, the fact that Shaul had this Ruach Hashem, which he did beforehand and was connected to God on such a level, and now he's not, 
is the loss, is the ruachra, is where his, where his anxiety and depression and all that they speak of that comes from. So now this is going to be step one into um, Shaul, um, David getting into Shaul, into the king's house, because what happens is that his, his um, the other people, his other avadim, his other people in his court, his servants, his advisors, all that, they see, they see that, um, that he has this ruachra and he tells them, he, um, they tell him, you know, listen, you have this ruachra, why don't you get someone to menagen um, bekinor, to play the, the harp, and when you have the ruachra, they'll put you in a better, a better, a better state. Now that might seem a little a little odd, like why would just playing music help him be in a better state? But psychologically, we know that if you put on a certain type of music, it's going to change your mood. It's going to connect. It's going to affect you. Um, we see throughout the Navi um, um, that that um, that the music is connected to Nevoa, right? We see back in the, one of the times, one of the signs of Sh uh, Shmuel to Shaul is that when he sees the people playing instruments, he's going to get a Nevoa with them. So this wasn't something so far off. This is something that's a very common practice, um, connecting music to mood and to connection with God. So, and while he's suggesting this, right? Um, uh, he, one of his avadim says, I saw Yishai had a son, right? Yishai was obviously someone known in the community and in the, in, the, in the world, you know, in the, in the important, and he was an important person. He was he, one of his sons, Yodean, again, he plays, he's Gibor Chayil, he's a strong, he's a, Ish Lachama, he's a soldier. Navon, Davad, he's smart, Ish Toad, he's good looking, Ba'ashem Imor, and God is with him. So it's very interesting because we all of a sudden have this description of David, of, of, a musician, fine, but he's a warrior, and he's Ish, and he's strong, and he's smart, and he has all these great uh, uh, descriptions that we didn't have a minute ago. Before, he was just this kid, little kid that was a shepherd in the field that no one even paid mind to, you know, paid any attention to. So, what's going on here? So, there's two perspectives. One is that that the Evan is talking him up and putting him in a way that that Shaul will want him to have him. And the main point is that he's a good musician, but he wants him to think, oh, look how great he is, so you'll choose him. And the other point, the other perspective is, is no, he genuinely shifted into this person. Once the Ruach Hashem came onto him, he got all these other uh, great attributes because we see even with Shaul, when the Ruach Hashem comes, he becomes Ish Achei, he becomes Lev Achei, he becomes a different person. So it could be that, yeah, he was just the shepherd, but now he was able to, um, to really, um, strengthen himself in that way so um they he calls uh, Shaul calls um uh, David to he tells Yishai to send up David and it's sort of on a test run because we see he doesn't tell Yishai why he just calls him up and um and he goes and it's all a big exciting thing he sends gifts to the king like you're being called to the king's house it's a big spectacle and Shaul and he goes up to the uh, to the house of Shaul and he, and he plays for Shaul, well, he makes him an Osek Helim, he makes him one of his, uh, you know, men in waiting, you know, one of his butler type of men that comes with him around. And he, and he, he loves him, by Behu, it says he loves him, he had a very strong connection with David. And he played for him and he told him to come and uh, to stay in his house, right? He, he tells, he tells uh, Yishai, Yamona David Fanaiki Matzachen ben to take residence in the king's, uh, in the king's palace. And every time, that um, Shaul would have this Ruach Ra'ah, that would play for him. And this is gonna come into play later, remember that. So we're gonna see that from now on, Sha uh, David is essentially a permanent resident in the king's house, in the king's castle. Um, he will go back and forth to his father's house, but he's really part of the king's family through this. Now, um, um, okay, so now when all this is happening, we have again, the police team coming to fight. And this time, the Plishtim are, um, are um, we learned, this is the fourth time the Plishtim are coming, right? We had them with Eli um, and his sons. We had them with uh, Shmuel. We had them with uh, Shaul and Yonatan the first time when Yonatan wins the war. Uh, you're not going to go into all those in detail. We spoke about that about other times. But at, one thing I will mention is that all those other times are not equally matched. Right. If you remember, the police team always had a big advantage. They had more weapons. They had more people. They had better cavalry. They had better better defense. Everything was better. And it seems like in this war, at this point, they're pretty equally um, matched, except for Goliath, because we see what happens. Goliath comes out, 
and he makes his claim. And, and first of all, they describe him, I'm not gonna read all the Pesukim, but they describe him with this immense armor. And he's, 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 um, he's a, a warrior from his youth, he's trained for this. And he called out to the people and he says, and he's embarrassing God. And he says, basically it seems through his threat, like so why are we having a whole war? Again, showing that it might be, that they might be more, more equally matched than not. Why are we having a whole war? Someone should come and fight me and whoever wins the other will, will you know, be the, the, the subservient to the other. And he's mocking them and he's mocking the nation and, he's, and he mocks the, 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 the uh, Shaul. He says, Atem avadim le Shaul. He's not really a king, you're just slaves to him. And the Mephashim say he's calling out Shaul here because essentially who should come to fight Goliath? Shaul. Shaul as the king should come fight um, Goliath because we remember when the Bnei Sal asked for a king, they wanted a king to fight their wars for them. So the first person that should be coming out now is Shaul. This is Shaul. This is directly Shaul's battle. And we see the decline of Shaul's, um, of Shaul's um, involvement in the war is correlated to his ability to be king because of the fact that they wanted a king to be a leader in battle. Because we see, I brought here, that in, Nahash, in the war of Nahash, he also, in Yamoni, Shaul's first war, there was also an outlandish uh, request of taking out the eyes. And at that point, Shaul comes in and the Ruach Hashem comes on Shaul. He gets the nation together and he fights them and wins the war very quickly and easily. As opposed to here, where they were petrified. No one was able to go up and fight him. And he embarrasses them and, and it's really a bad situation. And now we see that also, also, um, I didn't bring Pesukim, but Shaul also knows it's his battle because he offers a reward. He says, whoever could fight, uh, could, could win, uh, could fight and defeat Goliath, they could marry my daughter, I meaning come into the king, into the king's family, and will get riches and standing in, in the in the in the Matsut, in the kingdom. So, and even we see how scared everyone was that even with that great reward of becoming a family of the king, that no one no one uh, takes up the offer until David comes down. And David sees, we see that David, his three older brothers go to the war and Sh David is sent down to, um, to give his brothers food and see how they're doing. Um, also, I'm just gonna mention this, but if you wanna look at your own study, not, not, not for now, but there's a lot of connections to David and his brothers and Yosef and his brothers and the Tikkun, very interesting, but I'm not going into that now. Anyway, he goes down and David hears this. He hears um, uh, Goliath mocking God and mocking the nation and, and he says, what, what do you mean no one's going to go and take off Israel? No one could take away this embarrassment from Israel that he's, that he's, that this uncircumcised, that we said this was the insult that they used to the Pishim, this uncircumcised person, like what, is, what validity does he have? He's uncircumcised. He has no connection to the beat with God, right? The connect, like the beat Milah is showing our connection to God. So when you call, when he's calling him an Arel, He's saying, you are, have no connection to God. How are you embarrassing? How are you embarrassing God, embarrassing the nation? And God is the Elohim Hayim. God is the, um, you know, the, the, the living and true God. So he, he, he starts saying this. His brother ends up saying, don't talk like that. Who do you think you are? You're not going to be able to go fight him. And, and, um, and David says, no, what does he do? He goes to, um, he goes to Shaul and he says, I'm going to fight him. And Shaul um, doesn't believe him. He says, right? Again, everyone looks at, at this point, we're going to see soon he will, it will shift. But at this point, uh, Shaul does not see David as a viable threat at all. He knows he lost his mahu, but he does not feel threatened about it at all. He says, you're not. And, and he's, he's a trained warrior from his youth. And Shaul and David tell Shaul, no, when I was, he gives him this elaborate story. When I was um, watching the sheep, there was a, there was a lion and a bear and they came to get my flock and I killed them. And the, and he says, um, and he says the way, the God who saved me from this um, lion and bear, he's going to save me from from the Pishti. And when he invokes God's name and he, and he shows Shaul that I know it's all about God, it has nothing to do with me personally, Shaul says, okay, Hashem Yaymach, God will, you know what, you want to do it, God will be with you. And he dresses David in his armor, which is very interesting because we see dressing in, dress in, in Tanakh 
when someone gets dressed in someone else's clothes, it's almost a passing on, like a, 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 a role. Like when Aaron dies, he dresses his son in his, in his uh, the Kiona to show that he's passing on the Kiona to him. So inadvertently, Shaul is essentially by doing this, maybe some, you know, unconsciously, he's giving over the Malchut to David in a way, in, in a weird way. And we're gonna see in the next in the next section, there's another, um, a brit, a connection made with clothing with Yonatan and David, which we'll talk about next time. And he puts on all this armor and, and, and David says, I can't fight with this armor. I'm not used to wearing all this armor. And he takes himself, he, he rids himself of the armor and he goes to, the, uh, to Goliath, dressed in his regular clothes, holding the, these five stones in his pocket and his uh, slingshot. And he goes to, to, um, to the plishti, to um, Goliath. And Goliath sees him. And again, everyone's looking at David as a nothing. He says, am I a dog? He says, what am I a dog that you have this stick? What are you gonna do to me? You know, ask me to play fetch, you know, so to speak. And he starts cursing David and God and his God, meaning Hashem. And David says here, which I think is one of the most um, like, you know, turning points to Kim and showing uh, is that David's identity. He says, you come to me with swords and, and, and spears and armor and all these things and I come to you with God. That's all I need. I need God with me. God doesn't need any, any fanfare. God is going is to uh, help us win this war because he's God. And um, we see this mirrors a lot of the language of Yonatan in the last war, right? He says, All attributing the, the uh, right? All this connection with God being a savior. We're going to see Yonatan and, and David have very similar ideology and mantras and, and feelings and connections to God. And that's why they have a very strong connection to each other, which we'll see, um, which we'll see later. Um, so also, by the way, something interesting to notice is all this talk of Cherev and Hanit and Kidyon and all this armor and, 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 um, and swords and spears, it's obviously very clearly an insult to Goliath, right? And, and, and dig at Goliath, but it's also, um, um, underhandedly a little bit, a dig at Shaul, because we're going to see through um, his life, especially later on, um, uh, as he, when he when he has his as when he's chasing David, he is so reliant on the sword and on his spear and on his physical protection that he doesn't fully put himself in the in the protection of God, and that's where his downfall is. And it's ironic that that when Sha when um, David he kills Goliath, right? Well, he doesn't he he, he slings uh, the 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 the, the stone to his eye, he falls, and then he takes Goliath's sword and cuts his head off with his own with Goliath's own sword, because it says the in Bayad David. David didn't have a sword. He took he took um why do you say He took a uh, Goliath's sword to kill him. And it's also ironic that Shaul's end, his death comes at his own sword, which we'll talk about later. So both Goliath and Shaul die at the hands of their own sword, essentially, because they put too much faith in the sword and not in God. Um, uh, and now um, I'm going to end with this, but it's very, very enigmatic. I have, I have, give me a couple more minutes, but it's, I think, not I think, it is one of the most enigmatic sections of, uh, of Tanakh. And there's been many, many Mephashim that talk about it. And I'm not going to sit, I could give a whole class on just these Sukim right now, um, more than a whole class, but I'm really going to focus in on a few points that I think will connect to what we're speaking about. But if you're interested, read about these Sukim, there's a lot of different theories about it. So after the war, they're victorious. Sha uh, David uh, goes to Shaul and brings him the head of, uh, of Goliath, showing victory. And he says, Vakirot Shaul et David. Shaul sees David. And he says, Amar elav, Amar elav ner sar oh, he talks, tells Amner, his head of his chief of his army, Ben Mizahanar, uh, uh, Ben Mizahanar, who is this boy? And Amner, Vayomer, Amner, Chai Nafshecha, Amelech, Imedati. I have no clue. So this is very odd because David was, has been living in Shaul's house and playing music for him. It says he loved him by Ahehu. He just went before to ask him permission or, or to tell him that he's going to go fight Goliath. How does he not know who he is? And not only that, Abner doesn't, says he doesn't know who he is as well. 
ואומר המלך שאל את האבן מי זה גועס כם וגשו דבים מהקודל בשבי וקח אותו אבנט אבנט פיקסם ויעביר את בני שאול ולא שב בשבי ידו ואומר עליו שאול בן מי אתה ענת ואומר דוד בן עבדך ישי בית הלחמי He brings him to Shaul, he says, who are you? I am the son of Yishai Beit HaLachmi. Very, very weird, based on everything we just said. How does he not know who he is? Why does Avner not know who he is? Why does David even answer him, I'm Ben Yishai Beit HaLachmi? Like, what's going on here? So again, like I said, there's many different, different interpretations of this, but what I'm going to say, and what I feel is, is I connect to is, it's not necessarily that he didn't know who he was. It's more of a, like, who does he think he is? Like he did not see David as a threat until now. He, he, David was the Na'ad, David was Katan, David was a, was a nobody. He was just this little musician, this Ro'eson. He didn't have any qualities of a warrior. He didn't have any qualities that could be threatening to Shaul. And now Shaul's eyes are opening and saying, really, who is this guy, right? It's like, it's like how, how did I not see this? Like if you find out something, a new information about someone you've been friends with for a long time, it's like, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that other side of you, right? He's very shocked by that. And I also, I mean, this is just a little bit of a little, like a funny thing, but just because I'm a teacher, I, I've taught little kids for many years. And I find it also when you see someone in a different context, it, it really, it really uh, it messes with them. Like when I would see the, the kids, like the third, fourth, fifth graders, the younger ones, especially if you see them in the, in the supermarket or at a, a wedding or a bar mitzvah, you know, anything out of school, they look at you like you have seven heads like what are you doing here how are you you know don't you live in the school like they don't understand that you have a context outside of being their teacher in the school but then the next day when they see you in the school they're like oh I saw you at so-and-so or whatever and it becomes a whole thing so I think it's, it's 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 twofold it's part of of Shaul's eyes opening and seeing David for who he is that is a threat to him um, and that is someone who has the potential to be the king and to be a warrior and to be someone that is really connected to God and is really leadership material and all these things that Shaul is not. So I think here we're going to see, like we said in the beginning, um, we're going to continue to see throughout the rest of David and Shaul's relationship and their life, you know, as Shaul, uh, Shaul's life is that in a way, every time David's the problem, he's also the solution. And every time David lifts up and he tries to, to and, he, and then, then Shaul falls down, there's this up and down and there's this give and take of their relationship that essentially doesn't end, even doesn't end when, when Shaul dies, we're gonna see even after with, that it, it still haunts David in different ways, um, their relationship. And um, to end here, I just wanna talk one sentence more about Yonatan and we'll talk more about him a lot next time is that, Yonatan, as opposed to having a strong relationship with his father, uh, being the heir apparent um, and, and feeling connected to him, as opposed to that, he ends up having a very uh, strong connection to David, um, which essentially is a threat to him, basically, because Shaul is, is still king. No one's, no one's kicking him out of his role, but essentially Sha da Sha David is kicking out Yonatan from becoming the next king. And he will see is a very interesting character, one of my favorite characters in Tanakh. We'll talk about him more next week. And also Michal, um, Shaul's daughter, who ends up falling in love with da David. And Shaul uses, is gonna use that in a way to hopefully in his mind, uh, Cause David's downfall, but again, she also is very strongly connected to um, David and helps him. So, just to sum up, we see that that everything that Shaul isn't that that, Sha that Shaul lacks his confidence, his connection to God, um, his faith in God is what David has. He is only connected to God. Everything is Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. I'm fighting for God. I God who helped me, sa who saved me. It's all about his connection to God. So we're going to see how this is going to is going to tie throughout the rest of the story with the whole drama between Shaul and um, David, um, which will continue till Shaul's um, till Shaul's death. So um, thank you for coming. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer, um, and uh, hopefully see you next week.